Welcome to Nuclear Hot Seat, the weekly international news magazine keeping you up to date on all things anti-nuclear. My name is Libby Halevi. I am the producer and host, as well as a survivor of the nuclear accident at Three Mile Island from just one mile away. So I know what can happen when those nuclear so-called experts get it wrong. This week, we continue our education on exactly what's wrong with the Nuclear Regulatory Commission's consideration of the radiation-denying hormesis theory. We speak with Dr. Ian Fairley, a British scientist and independent consultant on radioactivity in the environment who lives in London and has been one of my favorite guests here on Nuclear Hot Seat. We'll also get our fifth lesson on social media super tricks, Weekly quick tips on how to get the most out of your anti-nuclear online presence. This is with the irrepressible Dave Parrish of Operation Save the Earth. There will also be a serious update on the website problems which have been plaguing NuclearHotSeat.com and let you know of the progress that has been made. Plus, our regular Numb Nuts of the Week, activist shout-outs, and more nuclear information than has been told in all of every episode of NPR's Wait, Wait, Don't Tell Me, really a failing on their part. And all of this will be coming up in just a few moments. Today is Tuesday, August 18, 2015, and here is the week's anti-nuclear news. Starting off in Japan, where the Prime Minister, Shinzo Abebebe, announced on August 11th that it was safety first in order to start the nuclear power plant in Sendai. And five days later, only 50 kilometers or 31 miles away, the Sakurajima volcano showed a spike in seismic activity. Japan's weather agency issued a warning that the possibility for a large-scale eruption had become extremely high and warned that there was a possibility for a large-scale evacuation of over 600,000 people in the area. Instant karma. And even worse, Sendai Nuclear Power Plant has not designated a site for relocating nuclear fuel in the event of a massive volcanic eruption. In the biggest class action suit to date against Tokyo Electric Power Company, 4,000 plaintiffs seek to dramatically increase TEPCO's liability for Fukushima Daiichi by proving negligence under Japan's civil law rather than simply proving harm and seeking compensation. The lawsuit is based in part on a judge's forced disclosure of a 2008 internal document prepared for managers at TEPCO warning of the need for precautions against an unprecedented nuclear catastrophe. 2008! This case and others could further increase opposition to nuclear restarts, which in many polls consistently beats support for nuclear by about a factor of two to one. Plaintiffs are seeking 20 million yen each, approximately $160,000, in damages from TEPCO. More than 10,000 evacuees and nearby residents have brought at least 20 lawsuits against the utility and the government over the handling of the disaster at the Fukushima Daiichi nuclear plant. Regarding radiation impact, Japanese scientists have found signs of radiation poisoning in 17 dead dolphins near Fukushima. In April of this year, scientists from Japan's National Science Museum conducted autopsies on the beached dolphins and found that nearly all of them had lungs that were entirely white, indicating a condition known as ischemia, that is, loss of blood to the organs. Ischemia is a well-known symptom of radiation poisoning. Baby crows were observed in Fukushima that were blind and could not fly. According to the work of Dr. Tim Mousseau, professor of biological sciences at the University of South Carolina, many organisms showed increased rates of deformities, developmental abnormalities, eye cataracts, and even tumors or cancers. Mousseau said that data show that bird species and abundances are in sharp decline, and the situation is getting worse. A freelance journalist in Itate Village reported that the sound of cicada is decreased. And by now, most of us are familiar with the pictures of the deformed daisies from that area, pictures that were originally broken to the media by Iori Mochizuki and Fukushima Diary. 
These flowers are the latest in a long list of mutated life forms being reported in Fukushima. Which makes it rather ironic that the weekend of August 20th to 23rd, the Mitsua Marketplace in Torrance, California, just south of Los Angeles International Airport, will be presenting the Rising Tohoku Food Fair, presenting flavorful and refined cuisine, as well as delicious chow from Tohoku. Nowhere in the press materials does it include the mention that one of the six prefectures in the Tohoku region is Fukushima. If I were there, I would certainly pass on the free samples. Here in the United States, billions, that's not an exaggeration, billions of fish have washed up dead in Alaska. Salmon, baby herring, needlefish, and smelts were all among the species that took the hit. Now, warm water is being blamed for these deaths, but doesn't radiation heat water? Yet none of the so-called experts interviewed to date mention the F-word, Fukushima, or the R-word, radiation. You can't get conclusive evidence if you're not looking for it. And now here's the latest from the Nuclear Regulatory Commission duck <coughs> and cover report. At the Seabrook Nuclear Power Station in New Hampshire, only 42 miles away from Boston on the Atlantic coast, additional degradation of concrete related to the alkali silica reaction in the containment enclosure building was found by inspectors for the Nuclear Regulatory Commission earlier this summer. But NRC officials said the findings were no cause for concern, probably because they're all on government-issued Ativan. Just kidding. The finding was considered the first of the NRC's four color-coded levels of concern, and ironically, that level is labeled green. NRC spokesman Neil Sheehan engaged in a tremendously contorted string of explanations as to why this was not a safety issue, even though it is continuing to be monitored. Perhaps his verbal contortions were related to the fact that this form of concrete degradation which was initially discovered at Seabrook in 2010, remains the last hurdle in Next Era Energy's attempt to renew the license at Seabrook next year. If that renewal is approved, it will extend the plant's license by 20 years, allowing it to stay in commission and Nuclear Regulatory Commission employees to remain employed until 2050. <laughs> On Monday, August 18th, a delivery truck triggered an emergency response at the Savannah River site in Georgia, a former atom bomb-making site that still handles nuclear materials. A delivery truck caught the attention of a bomb-sniffing dog, and initial electronics tests also indicated the possibility of explosive residue. It took two hours after the site issued its first security alert to the public that investigators announced they had found no explosive residue or devices on the truck. No word of what triggered this alert. <laughs> and not NRC, but close enough, a federal judge ruled this week that the Department of Energy will be required to build new storage tanks for high-level radioactive waste at the Hanford Nuclear Reservation in Washington State if it does not meet certain deadlines related to cleanup projects. Hanford contains 177 nuclear waste tanks, some of which have leaked. It is the nation's largest collection of radioactive waste left over from the production of plutonium for nuclear weapons starting in the 1940s. Since 2011, the Energy Department has repeatedly told the state that it cannot meet their deadlines. To be continued forever. <laughs> Regarding Canada's insistence on building an underground storage site for nuclear waste in Kincardine, Ontario, less than one mile away from the shores of Lake Huron, Democratic Senator Debbie Stabenow from Michigan has come up with a great tactic. The 1909 Boundary Waters Treaty with Canada requires countries on each side of the international border to review the risks of anything happening to water that is common to them both. Senator Stabenow plans to introduce legislation next month built around the 1909 treaty that would mandate the U.S. State Department to act to review the facility's risk 
and compel the Canadian government to review alternative locations. And while most candidates for the nominations of their parties for the 2016 presidential election have said nothing about nuclear, this statement popped up from Vermont Senator Bernie Sanders' campaign. What is Bernie's view on so-called clean nuclear energy? Bernie has called for a moratorium on nuclear power plant license renewals in the United States. He believes that solar, wind, geothermal power, and energy efficiency are more cost-effective than nuclear plants, and that toxic waste byproducts of nuclear plants are not worth the risks of the technology's benefit. Senator Sanders also questioned why the federal government invests billions into federal subsidies for the nuclear industry. Internationally, wildfires in the Chernobyl Exclusionary and Mandatory Resettlement Zone were still being extinguished as of August 17 in the morning. The fires had been burning for more than a week. An intergovernmental agreement between Russia and Mexico on cooperation in the peaceful uses of nuclear energy has entered into force, according to Russian state nuclear corporation Rosatom. We'll talk about why this is so not a good idea in today's final thought. Norway's government wants to dump 1,200 tons of radioactive waste on an island an hour south of Oslo, even though the waste company which owns the site believes it is too dangerous. As one industry trade executive put it, placing radioactive waste in the middle of the Oslo Fjord, which is the fjord for 2 million Norwegians, is about as far from being smart as it is possible to go. Switzerland is currently without any nuclear power, as all of the country's reactors are temporarily offline for different reasons. And guess what? The country is still functioning smoothly. Leave it to the Swiss. The arrest of the longtime head of Brazil's nuclear energy utility on corruption charges could disrupt a plan to revive Brazil's nuclear ambitions. Orthon Luis Pinheiro da Silva, a retired admiral, was arrested on Tuesday, July 29, for allegedly taking 4.5 million reais, or $1.35 million, in bribes from engineering firms working on the long-delayed Angra 3 nuclear power plant. And finally, Nuclear hot seat, nuclear hot seat, nuclear hot seat, none that's out of week. Of all the many solemn remembrances, of the 70th anniversary of the United States dropping atomic bombs on Hiroshima and Nagasaki, two of the darkest actions in the history of the world. There had to be at least one numbnuts, and his name is David Bailey. Bailey, who claims to have once been an engineer at the Sellafield nuclear facility in England and is staunchly pro-nuclear, said he felt the need to commemorate the anniversary of these two nuclear disasters. So he named a beer for them. That's right. Bailey, who became the founder of Hard Knot Brewery, has named his latest beer Nuclear Sunset. How does this idiot justify this move? He claims he wanted to recognize the tragedy that marked the dawn of the nuclear age. And what better way to mark the events that caused the death of approximately a quarter of a million people than to name some alcohol after it. Alcohol to numb your response to these horrific events. Bailey went on to say, This beer was brought out to commemorate the awful loss of life during the first and only military deployment of nuclear weapons. He must have been using his own product because there were two incidents. Hiroshima was first, Nagasaki was second. Hiroshima, Nagasaki, two hard knot, two bombs, two military deployments, two inflictions of misery beyond anything the world had ever seen to that point and has seen since. It is despicable that you would bring out a beer and not only call it nuclear sunset, but include the subtitle, Disarmingly Peaceful Wit. No, you half-wit. That, even that is a, a compliment to you. This is the definition of tone-deaf, atrocious bad taste. And that is why you, David Bailey and your stupid, insipid beer, are this week's 
commemorated the dawn of the nuclear age, and he calls it nuclear sunset. The guy must have been drunk when he came up with it. We'll have our featured interview in just a moment, but first, I want to thank, sincerely, those of you who have already donated to the Nuclear Hot Seat Let's Get This Website Up and Running Fund. We're more than halfway there in our search for donations. Yay! Halfway to an improved, more functional, Fort Knox level protected website, including the entire archive going back over 215 episodes. There's still an emergency landing page up, which is what you will see if you go to nuclearhotseat.com, and that's where you can access links to the last two weeks of shows, as well as, well, you've already found it, but this one will be there as well. That's where you will also find a secure link, secure link, to make donations, either through PayPal or directly from your credit or debit card. As I said, we're more than halfway able to being able to go ahead on the website fix, but donations are still needed to get us over the top. Another $600 will do it. So if you have ever thought of donating to Nuclear Hot Seat, now would be the perfect time. Any amount is appreciated, and no amount is insignificant. Every donation, no matter the size, I take as a sign of your caring about the show, and that alone helps keep it and me going. Please, don't wait. Go to the temporary webpage at NuclearHotSeat.com to find that secure donate link. And if you prefer not to donate online, Email me at info at nuclearhotseat.com. Yes, that part is up and running again. Info at nuclearhotseat.com for a snail mail address to send your donation. Know that I'm deeply touched, not only by the generosity of those of you who have chosen to donate thus far, but also the notes of support that I've received as well. You guys are the best, and I love being able to provide this service for you. So whatever you can do to help at this time, thank you. Dr. Ian Fairley is an independent consultant on radioactivity in the environment living in London, UK. He has studied radiation and radioactivity since the Chernobyl accident in 1986. He received his doctorate from Princeton on the radiological hazards of nuclear fuel reprocessing and from 2000 to 2004 was head of the Secretariat of the UK government's SERI Committee on Internal Radiation Risks. He has been a consultant on radiation matters to the European Parliament, local and regional governments, environmental NGOs, and private individuals. He's also been a guest several times on Nuclear Hot Seat and we welcome him always. He joined me via a less-than-cooperative Skype from his home in London. Ian Fairley, it is always a pleasure to have you here on Nuclear Hot Seat. It's my pleasure to Libby. Let's start out with the basics. Explain to the listeners what the linear no-threshold model is for determining radiation's impact and effect on us. Yeah, what it means is that as you reduce the radiation dose by a factor of two, then the results, the effects will be reduced by a factor of two. In other words, as you go down, the relationship between dose and effect is linear. It doesn't go up and down like a yo-yo. It's straightforwardly linear, straight line. That's the first part of the LMT. The second part of the linear no threshold is the fact that there is no safe threshold. In other words, no matter how low you go, there's a little risk. The only safe dose is zero. The reason why there's so much argument uh, and exchange of views about the linear no threshold is that as you go down lower and lower and lower and lower, people think, well, there must be a safe level. But there isn't. It means that you're always going to be have an effect. And the fact that there is no safe level upsets a lot of people. It really does. Let me give you an example of what I mean by low doses. If you were to take, say, a thousand people and give them each one millisievert 
of radiation, as a small dose of radiation. We know from all of the research work that we've done that about 10 people out of those 1,000 would later die from a cancer. We ten fatal cancers. But the thing is, we don't know which 10 people. All that would happen is, and this is a good way of understanding it, is that each of those 1,000 people would be given a negative lottery ticket. Now, your readers will be familiar with lottery tickets. Many of them will buy lottery tickets. And you'll get 10 tickets, and you'll hope that one of them will win. Well, what happens here is that if you get a dose of radiation, then you are given a negative or unlucky lottery ticket, and your number may come up. might not, but it might. Here's another example. Many people of our age used to smoke a long time ago, and all our friends used to smoke. Um, some people died from lung cancer, but other people didn't. In other words, there was a bit of a lottery here. Sometimes you got it, sometimes you didn't. It's the same with radiation. Some people are going to get it, others don't. And we don't really know why. All we can do is give you the number who will die. And radiation doses are cumulative over time. So yes. if someone gets a millisievert in a year and doesn't develop cancer, that does not preclude the millisieverts they get the following year and the year after that and the year after that, Correct. accumulating Correct. so that they have a greater impact on health. Yeah, yeah. Indeed, all of us in the world get background levels of radiation, right? And we can work out the number of people who will die from background radiation because it so happens that the amount of background radiation we get, say, I'm just going to talk about gamma right now, not alpha from radon, but each of us gets about a millisievert a year of background radiation. So if you live to, say, you're 90, you get 90 millisieverts of background radiation. And that does involve a risk, and people will die from it. Indeed, quite a few radiation scientists think that radiation is linked with aging. It's part of the reason why we're not immortal, why we die. The key thing is this, is that um, as we age, we can tell that our bodily functions, our livers, our kidneys, our skin, our brains, all deteriorate. And the reason why they deteriorate is because partly it has to do with the yearly insult of background radiation. It damages the cells. They're not able to reproduce as quickly as or as effectively as they used to. It kills cells sometimes. And the result is we age. And that's one of the reasons why we die. It's not the only reason, by the way. There are viruses, there are colds, there are infections, there are trauma, I mean, car accidents, etc. Et but, I mean, these sort of bacterial and viral infections, they are sort of like one-offs. We get a cold, and then a week or two later, we're okay. But with background radiation, it's all the time, 24 hours a day. 365 days a year. I had a question about background radiation for a while, and maybe you can answer this. Okay. We seem to assume that background radiation is always there and always has been as a constant. But I'm wondering if there was ever a measurement that was taken or that we can discern from before 1945 when atmospheric bombs were being blown up so that radiation levels were increased, and do we know a rate at which this background radiation has increased as we have moved through the first 70 years of the nuclear era? That's a good question. I don't know the answer. I don't know of extant evidence measuring background radiation before, say, 1945. I'd have to go back and, and work it out. However, there are studies which measure the amount of radioactive fallout from the atmospheric test bomb. If you go back to the early reports of UNSCEAR, UNSCEAR stands for United Nations Scientific Committee on the Effects of Atomic Radiation, you can find older reports which discuss the amount of radioactivity in the air. Now, that is, doesn't fully answer your question. You talk about dose. And getting from radioactivity, say from cesium and strontium, to dust is very complicated. 
but you can get a proxy on it. Your next question is, how much has that increased? It certainly has increased, but I would have to go back to my and crack open the books to figure out by how much. Can I give you another little anecdote? And that is this. When they are making radiation meters, detection equipment for radioactivity and radiation, they have to use metals which have got very, very low amounts of cesium and strontium in them, right? Mm -hmm. Because otherwise they screw up the readings, right? It's going to skew the results, yeah. Exactly, right. And do you know where they get the metal for that? No. From World War I battleships sunk up on the north of Scotland after the end of the First World War, German battleships, but they were scuttled up a place called Scapa Flow. And they go down there and they get this, this steel from that, it's very expensive, and use it in order to get what they call low background steel. That's the only way they can trust that it hasn't been yeah. contaminated yeah. by radiation. Yeah. yeah, because it's been at the bottom of the sea since 1918. So let's keep going with this to understand the compare and contrast. You've talked a little bit about linear no threshold, and we can get back to that. But in contrast, what are the hormesis people saying? By the way, I usually say hormesis, no, horusis for believing and talking about this as though it's something credible. But anyway, <laughs> we can drop that bad joke for now. And what is Hormesis' theory saying, and where in the world does this thing come from? In the 1950s and 1960s, there were a lot of radiation biology experiments in cell cultures and on little uh, lab animals like rats and mice. That they were done to figure out what the effects of radiation were. Some of those studies showed, some by the way, not all, maybe about a quarter of them, showed that if you gave a tiny little dose to these lab animals and then followed it up later, say an hour later, with a bigger dose, like say, you start off with a little tickle dose of one millisievert and then gave them one sievert, a thousand times bigger, and looked at the results, you would find that the cells or the mice who had received a tickle dose did better than the mice who had not received a tickle dose. Right? That's really obscure, but okay. It's not all that surprising. There is evidence for that in chemistry as well. But the it, key thing is this. It's irrelevant for radiation protection. Let me tell you why. All of us, again, it comes down to background radiation, all of us get tickle doses every day of the week, every day of the year. Does that mean that we're therefore protected from other doses of radiation coming in the future? Well, how would we tell? <laughs> I mean, the point is that we're all, we're, all of us are exposed to it. Another way of looking at it is this. We know from experience, or from, not from experience, actually from a lot of studies, epidemiological studies, that background radiation itself is harmful. And there's quite a few studies showing that now. We know, for example, that about 20% perhaps of all background cases of leukemia are due to radiation. Some people think it may be even all background cases of leukemia. Leukemia occurs in children naturally. There's a natural occurrence rate. And some scientists think that part or all of those is due to background radiation. So that knocks this, this whole theory of radiation being good for you right on his head. It just makes a nonsense of it. Here's another example. Most people don't get big doses of radiation, okay? The only place where I can think of where people deliberately get big doses of radiation is in radiation therapy. There was those people who need to get high radiation doses to deal with a thyroid cancer or a big lump in their brain or a tumor somewhere or other. Those people, the people who are receiving radiation therapy, do get big doses, right? Do we give them a little tickle beforehand? No, we don't. Of course we don't. If you were to mention that to therapists who work in the hospital, they would think you're crazy. We don't do it. Or here's another example. Think about nuclear workers who work in nuclear power stations. They're exposed to relatively high levels of radiation Instead of getting a millisievert a year, which is the background rate, they may get a millisievert every two weeks, something like that. 
do they show that they are more protected? No, they don't. They show a healthy worker effect, but they show the healthy worker effect for everything, whether it's asbestos levels, whether it's dioxin levels or whatever. Ordinary workers are a cut above the frail people who are old or sensitive people who are young. So apart from the healthy worker effect, no. So there isn't a lot of evidence or helpful anecdotes or experience which shows us that hormesis is a useful concept in radiation protection. In fact, it's the other way around. Many official studies have shown that it doesn't have any relevance whatsoever for radiation protection. Then what do you believe led the Nuclear Regulatory Commission to take these three petitions so seriously that they now have them up for public comment and it looks like they are seriously considering replacing linear no threshold with hormesis as the standard for evaluating dangers of radiation exposure? Well, I don't know the answer to that. I've mentioned in the paper that I wrote that it's clear that the NRC must have some sort of discretion to discard frivolous or mischievous or time-wasting petitions. And it's a bit worrying that they have taken these three petitions on board. I don't think it's much use to speculate why they accepted it. What is the danger, then, of the NRC taking these petitions seriously enough to put them up for comment? The dangers are that they may take it seriously and act on it. I hope they don't, but you never know. There are a few things on our side, though, and I hope your listeners will take heart of this. In my report, I've listed about half a dozen or so United States official bodies, which appear to me to be highly questioning of this nonsense about our missiles. Put it this way, a number of their scientists have engaged in studies which show that the LNT is the appropriate model to use. And these are big bodies like, for example, the Centers for Disease Control down in uh, Savannah, Georgia. Oh, sorry, Atlanta, Georgia. There's the NIOSH, the National Institute for Occupation and Safety and Health. There's the United States Department of Energy. There's the United States Environmental Protection Agency. They're listed in the report that I made. Now, these are heavyweight organizations. They've got good scientists working on them. They're not compromised like the NRC. And I'm very much hoping that the NRC will listen to what they have to say. The problem with the NRC, and I say this with the best will in the world, is that they have a very bad track record when it comes to regulating the nuclear industry. Indeed, a number of environmental groups think that instead of regulating the industry, they're basically a promotion outfit. They're the biggest fan club for the nuclear industry. You get no argument here? I don't like saying that, but there's a lot of evidence suggesting that the NRC is very, very badly captured. I mean, basically, the, the old saying is it should be a, a watchdog, but instead it's a lapdog. Well, that metaphor is not strong enough now. The NRC really is rooting and tooting for the nuclear industry. And there's a reason for it, because the American nuclear industry is in decline right now. There's about half a dozen reactors closed down. There's more scheduled to close down. Because they're all, most of the reactors in the United States are past their sell-by date, and they're going to have to close down. That's basically a certificate for the NRC to saying, right, you're going to go as well. And they're fighting for job protection, basically. Well, that's not good enough. Um, that might be all very well for the staffers of the NRC, but it's not good for us. It's not good for people or the environment, which is their slogan uh, about who they're supposed to be protecting. Now, something that it's important for listeners to understand, and that you've referenced a number of times, is this really terrific written report that you have on your website. It's a PDF, which sets out the entire issue here and is a complete refutation to hormesis. 
and it is available not only to people who want to educate themselves and include comments from it or have their comments to the NRC guided by it, but to take a shortcut, you can just take a link to the PDF and put it in with your comments to the NRC. What is the report, and how can people access it? It's an 11-page report. What it does is it sets out the main arguments that are used by the hormesis advocates. Another phrase for them, and by the way, is radiation deniers. Oh, that's a much better one. Thank you. I'll use that from now on. Okay, radiation deniers. I've tried to use less inflammatory language and use the language that would be used by one scientist to another in an official publication. After all, I am a scientist, therefore I have observed the rules of the game. So my report is written as if it had been commissioned by a public body, and basically what they want is disinterested views. In other words, unbiased, straightforward, factual findings that isn't highly colored, um, or doesn't use, as I say, inflammatory language. What I do is that I look hard at the evidence that is used by our Mrs. advocates to see whether in fact it stands up or not. And what I find is that there is a little bit of radiation biology evidence. However, it's by no means conclusive. There is just as many studies, in fact even more, which don't show this effect. But even if it were to accept it, it wouldn't mean anything in terms of radiation protection. It would be irrelevant. And the reasons I give is because, well, we all have exposures to small amounts of radiation every day. Um, much smaller than the amounts used in these radiation biology experiments, by the way. A millisievert over a whole year, which is what the background level would be for the gamma radiation, isn't very much radiation. And I put in my uh, report, how would we tell if there were any benefits from this? Well, we can tell. <laughs> and even if we could tell, what would it matter? We can't avoid background radiation. In other words, it's irrelevant. So it sounds like this is false science, bad, put it in quote, science, of a propaganda sort to try and push forward an unscientific basis for evaluating radiation dose. Yes, I think that's a good way of putting it. I would say that some people are unable to accept that radiation has, low-level radiation has effects. In particular, in Japan, many Japanese scientists, I've noticed, well over the majority, don't seem to be able to accept that radiation has its low-level effects. What it would do is it would force them to frame Fukushima in a very different way for yes. the populace. And I think that there's tremendous yes. pressure on mm -hmm. the doctors over there and the researchers to yes. not only not tell the truth, but not be able to tell the truth or be challenged, we know in various cases, with losing their ability to practice, losing their funding, losing their job. Oh, yeah. So yeah. getting back to this report. Apart from mentioning hormesis and basically taking it apart, it also shows the linear no threshold evidence. There's about at least seven or eight studies, and they've all got graphs, and they all show straight lines going down to zero dose. And these studies are, for example, from radiation workers at Chernobyl. They are people who've been exposed to radiation therapists in Canada and the United States, nuclear workers in Britain, people who receive radon exposures in Norway and Sweden, and also background radiation, too. That's, that's another thing. There's about six examples that I give of where people have received small amounts of radiation and there are very large studies. In other words, these studies cannot be refuted because of uncertainty. These are studies which are very powerful indeed. They've got good, narrow confidence intervals. We can be quite sure that the findings are accurate. In other words, I would say that the evidence is incontrovertible, that the relationship between dose and risk is linear, and it goes all the way down to zero. So here's hoping that with 
the right amount of pressure on the NRC, which would be the, everyone who is listening to this audio going to your website, ianfairly.org, and finding this report, and then contacting the Nuclear Regulatory Commission by September 8th. That's the window of opportunity we have for response. It would be important for all of us to do so, so that we eliminate the opportunity for this false science to take the place of the accurate science. And for the little protection that the NRC does provide, we still get the opportunity to have it in place. By the way, I've heard from friends that they've gone onto the NRC website, and there are only 52 comments so far. Only hey, 52. We need 520. At least. 5,200. <laughs> Send in your comments. Please do. Yeah, yeah. Keep those cards and letters coming. Come on, it's the Internet. If you can post on Facebook, you can post to the NRC. And if you want to know what to say to access this report, where would they go and what would they have to click on? My website is www.ianfairley.org. Org, O-R-G. And by the way, Ian Fairley is spelled as follows. I-A-M-F-A-I-R-L-I-E. And if you go into my website, they'll be able to look at the latest post, latest blog, and there it is. Or if they have difficulty, just type in NRC, and it'll come up as well. By the way, I should say that many people have said to me, why don't I send it in myself? Well, I'm quite clear about this. I don't send it in. And what happened here was that about 10 or 12 people who say I've lost count in the United States emailed me and said, the US NRC is doing this. I don't know about this, but you do. Please help out. So I decided that the best way was to put it on my website. And that way, everybody in the whole world can access it. And they can use it. They can take bits out of it. There's lots of references <laughs> where they can do their own study. Go to ianfairley.org, take a look at this report, download the PDF, pull phrases out of it, or just include a connection to it inside your response. But if there are only yeah. 52 responses, I know that I'm one of them, it's time for us to get going and not procrastinate because I've been told that in many instances, the NRC does not look to the content of the comments that it gets, but to the number that it gets. And in yes. terms of those 52 responses, we don't know how many of those are larded with pro-hormesis people who are whipping them to a froth through their ranks. So yeah. non-nuclear yeah. people, get off Facebook, get on the NRC. That's a, good, a very good way of doing it. Also, the one thing I'd say to American people is that you've got about at least five big organizations, official organizations in America. Write to them as well. Say, look, would you please stop this hormesis stuff coming out of the NRC? And uh, those organizations are, are listed in my report. They include the US EPA, Department of Energy, NIOSH, uh, CDC, and various other bodies. I can't remember them all. Mm -hmm. uh, Department of Human Health as well. There are good people in the United States. All they have to do is get active. You know, there's an old saying is that for evil to prevail, all that there is required is for good people to do nothing. Mm -hmm. And so here, there are good people, but they've got to do something. Well, with your help and certainly as much of a push as I can provide through Nuclear Hot Seat, we will get those numbers up, we will get the responses up, and we will knock this particular strategy of pro-nukers out of the way before it can do more harm. Well done. Ian Fairley, as always, it's a joy to have you here, and thank you so much for being my guest this week on Nuclear Hot Seat. Again, it's my pleasure, Libby. All the best for now. That was Dr. Ian Fairley. His report on hormesis and what's wrong with using it as a basis for determining radiation health risks is available on his website, ianfairley.org, and that's spelled I-A-N-S, like Frank, A-I-R-L-I-E dot org. And a reminder that we need all of you 
even if you live outside of the United States, to comment to the Nuclear Regulatory Commission on the petitions before it to replace the linear no-threshold model of determining radiation dose and dangers, the gold standard, with radiation denial as represented by hormesis theory. I still can't post those links on the Nuclear Hot Seat website, but if you Google NRC, comma, petition, comma, hormesis, the link that came up second for me and is labeled Federal Register, Linear No Threshold Model, will take you to the petition, where you can then click on the green Submit a Formal Comment button. Then, let it rip. And we need all of you to do this because, according to Ian, as of last Friday, August 15, there were only 52 five, two comments on the petition. And there's no way to know that all of them were from anti-nuke activists. I suspect that they're not. So get off Facebook. Go to the site. Comment. And then send this information out to everyone you know on Facebook, Twitter, and email. Let's inundate the Nuclear Regulatory Commission with our statements on exactly what we think about the whole whore uses radiation denying debacle that they put up before us. Of course, once you get done with that, when you're on Facebook and elsewhere in social media, follow the advice of Dave Parrish of Operation Save the Earth. Dave is back with another social media super trick for activists. This one, our fifth in a series, Pretty Pictures. Hey guys, it's Dave from Operation Save the Earth, and I'm back again with part five of our eight-part social media super trick series. If you missed last week's installment on how to tweet on Twitter and make it count, check it out. This week I want to break down for you the evolutionary process of how some social platforms work so that you can find out how pretty pictures can speak louder than words on the internet. Throughout the history of the World Wide Web, social media sites have aped what other sites have done, and either it works, like how Facebook supplanted MySpace, which was basically the same interface with different colors, or it doesn't. Just ask Flickr. Still, pictures make the internet go around because they catch the eye quicker. Sites like Tumblr, which began in 2007, but has really come on strong the last few years because the younger market discovered it, now houses 99 billion posts for its almost 200 million users, most of which are, you guessed it, pictures. It's little wonder why social media platforms that are based around picture-heavy content like Tumblr, Pinterest, Instagram, and Snapchat have exploded in popularity recently. The mostly female and business market on Pinterest hosts over 1 billion pin boards for its 70-plus million users, with 2 million pins going up daily. Up from 40 million in 2012, Instagram's 300 million users now post 70 million Instagram pic posts a day. And the baby of the group, Snapchat, has in just four years' time gotten their 100 million users to post 400 million daily snaps. So as the younger market grows up with these platforms, things will continue to evolve. But some things, too, will never change because mankind can only take in so much info. You see, we're several updates behind where the technology is in this area. But right now, 58% of adults in America spend about an hour a day surfing for whatever on their smartphones. How much of that time do you think they spend on every single post they come across? That's right, literally just nanoseconds per post. If something doesn't catch the eye about wording from a headline, or these aren't the hashtags they're looking for, one thing that can help your case every time is a picture. Studies prove that posts with pics are by far more likely to get a click or a like than posts with just text. So with that in mind, here's your super trick for the week. Instagram is redefining what pic posts are on the web. Not for the food pics or selfies, but for the dimensions, typical landscape style pics don't wash in all social media platforms anymore because Instagram's 650 by 650 square box is taking over. 
Yes, that's right. The good old square is now the default pick type across all social media. And because most platforms resize things, when you do post your pictures for content, always make sure that it's 650 by 650 size or larger, or you'll get pixelation, and believe me, nobody wants to look at that. That's your super trick for the week. We'll see you next time. That was the inimitable Dave Parrish of OperationSaveTheEarth.com. Dave hosts Fuku Friday Happy Hour Hangout every Friday at 4.30 Eastern, 1.30 Pacific Time on Google+. Activist shout out! Just a reminder that after you leave your comments with the NRC to dump hormesis, go to change.org and in the search bar put in protect children from radiation exposure. When you get to that petition, which was started by Beyond Nuclear, it's time for you to sign again. They've got over 1,000 signatures, which was their initial goal, and now are going for 1,500. Do not delay. Remember, the pro-nuclear hormesis people who insist that radiation is good for you answer, no, it's not. But they are also rallying their troops. Let's not let them pass us and move their ridiculous agenda forward with the NRC. One other thing for you to know is that, as I mentioned before, the email info at nuclearhotseat.com is up and functioning again. If you sent anything to me between August 7 and 14 on that site, please resend. They just disappeared into the Internet ozone. Here's today's final thought. Did you know that there's no such thing as aftermarkets parts for nuclear reactors? Those would be replacement parts and equipment manufactured by other than the company of origin. Now, this concept works fine for cars, as AutoZone and all those other stores will attest. But it does not work for nukes, especially when it comes to fuel rods and fuel bundles. That means that once a nuclear company, which is connected with a nuclear country, provides the technology to build a nuclear reactor in another country, that second country that's new to nukes is going to be tied into the country of origin of their reactors forever. With the leading purveyors of nuclear technology being the U.S., Russia, and China, in essence, this is the newest iteration of the Cold War played out on the ground. National co-optation by nuclear market forces. The race is on for enforced allies based on nuclear technology. The U.S., Russia, and China are all competing to get third-world countries to take on their nuclear reactor technology. What's the danger? Well, as Russia made known to Ukraine during their latest skirmishes, they could withdraw their support on all matters nuclear, depending on how the political winds are blowing. That included Russia's willingness to step down from the construction of the new containment structure at Chernobyl. Talk about up a creek without a paddle. Fortunately, the European Union, rather than leading it up to the mostly impoverished Ukraine, understood that the effectiveness of the initial containment of Chernobyl was rapidly eroding. The original sarcophagus was only built to have a 30-year lifetime effectiveness, and 2016 will mark year number 30. The EU, with their landmass butt up against Eastern Europe, knows that Chernobyl is close enough to their countries to create horrific consequences yet again if it falls apart. So they coughed up the $300 million plus to keep the new sarcophagus under construction and on schedule. For that reason, the story I shared earlier about Mexico having a nuclear development pact with Russia should send chills to the hearts and minds of those who learn about it. Russia has agreed to provide Mexico with, are you ready, 
Research, design, construction, operation, life extension, decommissioning, training in the operation of nuclear power and research reactors, the provision and development of nuclear fuel cycle services, mainly the supply of nuclear fuel for research and power reactors, and radioactive waste management, among many other services. Somehow, I don't think that Russia is being altruistic. Remember, once you're in with a nuclear-providing country as your source, there is no way out. No aftermarket parts. You can't change suppliers. You have sold your soul and your future in order to be able to keep going back to your nuclear source. This will be the new map of the world. Allies and enemies kept in line by the threat of withdrawal of nuclear support and replacement parts. Pretty canny. Pretty terrifying. Actually, not pretty at all. Now, these are my observations, based on the reading I've been doing every week for more than four years to be able to put nuclear hot seat together. I don't know of anyone who is looking at this part of the nuclear puzzle and can ultimately confirm or deny that this may be exactly what's going on. If it is for real, it's a high-level strategy, and I suspect that it has not come about by accident. So are these observations, is this Sudoku patterning of events for real? Is there any way around it? Is there any way out of this latest nuclear corner into which it seems we have painted ourselves? Quite frankly, right now, your guess your opinion is as good as mine. This has been Nuclear Hot Seat for Tuesday, August 18, 2015. Material for this week's program has been researched and compiled from PowerForThePeopleVA.com, Phonologist.org, The Independent, Manichi, Wall Street Journal, GG Press, SputnikNews.com, Reuters, Adorali.com, Dr. Timothy Musso, WHYY, Smithsonian, Journal of Ornithology, Journal of Heredity, Fukushima Diary, and our friend Iori Mochizuki, who was the source of all those mutated daisy pictures that are all over the Internet without giving him credit. And I want to give him credit right now so you know where it came from. NeonNettle.com, MonstersAndCritics.com, MLive.com, SeacoastOnline.com, Reno Gazette Journal, Alaska Dispatch News, Juno Empire, Alaska Native Tribal Health Consortium, Fizz.org, ComoNews.com, MiamiHerald.com, Bernie Sanders, the local.no, that's Norway, KivPost.com, MarianneWildArt.wordpress.com, Counterpunch.org, the comically compromised writers for WorldNuclearNews.com, and the ever onward anti nuclear soldiers of the Nuclear Hot Seat community on Facebook, which you are all invited to join. Theme music written by me, sung by Marilee Weber, and accompanied by John Barnard. Nuclear Hot Seat is syndicated by UCY.tv and is also available on iTunes under podcasts. Our archive is available on the website, nuclearhotseat.com, or it will be once we get it back up and running again. For now, you can find it on iTunes. Our YouTube channel also carries the show under Nuclear Hot Seat Videos, with my thanks to Joni Ray. Nuclear Hot Seat is the activist voice on nuclear issues. So if you, yes you, have a story lead, a hot tip, or a suggestion of someone to interview, send an email to info at nuclearhotseat.com. We are copyright 2015, Libby Halevi and Heartistry Communications. All rights reserved, but fair use allowed, as long as proper attribution is provided. This is Libby Halevi of Heartistry Communications, the heart of the art of communicating, reminding you that we've all had our nuclear wake-up call. So don't go back to sleep, because we are all in the nuclear hot seat. Nuclear hot seat, what are those people thinking? Nuclear hot seat, what have those boys been drinking? Nuclear hot seat, the corium is sinking. Our time to act is shrinking, but the activists are linking. Nuclear hot seat.